when I was younger, um, I went, whenever I would do anything wrong, <clears throat> I would just fall into a near paralysis of guilt. And just I would just feel so upset that I'd done the wrong thing. And Swamiji would try to tell me that if you use all your energy on guilt, basically after you're finished feeling guilty, you just arrive back exactly where you started because you haven't used any energy to change. But the feeling that if I punish myself sufficiently, somehow that's the same <clears throat> as putting out energy to change. And honestly, that was one of those things that I didn't reject, but I simply absolutely, totally did not understand. I just, I could not, there was no place in my brain that I could get that um, it, for a lot of complicated reasons, okay? I was always very school smart, but school smart was like something I knew how to do. I came from a very educated family, and you know, I could read long before I went to school. I don't ever actually remember being taught anything. I just knew. So I could do school smart, and it meant nothing to me. Except, in the context, you get lots of praise for being school smart. So I always felt <clears throat> like a total... Um, I didn't realize any of this till many years later. But I felt like a fraud. Because I was, being, I was being valued entirely for something that was effortless for me. So I really developed a very complicated inner psychology. Um, thinking that there was a perfect me somewhere. And that this one, if, if I just was angry enough at this one and bullied her as much as I could, then there would be this day where the other one would pop out of the closet and say, hasn't this been fun? And then all of a sudden, the perfect me would be there. I was, I believe, about 36 when it came to me suddenly that this was it. You know, that this one, with all its weird limitations, which were enormous, I gained many things from my parents, but heart, how to work hard and be disciplined was not one of them. My mother wasn't, my father was, and for weird reasons I chose my mother. Okay? So I could do school without discipline, but I didn't have the discipline to learn or do anything, really. I was 36. So I realized, honey, this is it. And it, it crossed my mind that I had been just running this story where I thought if I just kept being upset with myself, that there was an alternative to me. Does this all make sense to you? It was a big story for me. So I decided, and because I was already long on the path, I'd been at Ananda for 15 years at that point, I started thinking about my life review. I love to think about my life review. You know, they say at the end, oh yes, thank you. They say at the end, you know, you, um, you get to look over the whole story and see what you've done. So I, I developed this concept, which it's, I still use it, which is, I could die on this. Meaning, if this is all I can carry to my life review, it's not nothing. And so when I was 36, I decided that I was a pretty nice person. <laughs> I wasn't going to be the world-changing savior of the planet. I wasn't going to be outstanding in any field, but I wasn't even, because I wasn't, I wasn't even a very nice person, but I was a pretty nice person. And I, and that became my mantra. I'm a pretty nice person. When I was sharing this thought with someone else, she said, her mantra became, I'm perfectly adequate. <laughs> <laughs> because, golly, reality always wins. You can just play the game as clever as you want to play it. And reality always wins. And if all I can claim when I die and have to stand in front of the masters is, I'm a pretty nice person, you know that's not nothing. I can die on this. And if they say, well, you had the opportunity to be more, yeah, but I didn't take it. Like, so, so I have a few more incarnations to go, but I'm a pretty nice person. Like that. And, and that led to something much more, which is what I was talking about which is there are two aspects to our response to our own behavior. You can do something that's really stupid. And here's two other mantras that are helpful in this context. If I could have done better, I would have done better. I mean, you never get up in the morning and say, let me see how much I can screw up this day. 
you know, how many wrong responses can I give? How much trouble can I make? You know, we get up in the morning and we want to do well. And if we could have done it better, we would have done it better. Again, reality always wins. What is the point of bashing our head against what is? And the other is, <clears throat> it always seemed like a good idea at the time. No matter how amazingly idiotic it seems in retrospect, it always seemed like a good idea at the time. You know, I wouldn't have done it if it didn't seem like a good idea. And you have to just develop a little bit of lightheartedness. So you, when you do something really dopey, that is, I mean, and sometimes the, the dopey things you do have terrible consequences. You know, people really get hurt. Projects are really ruined. Marriages and relationships are spoiled. Sometimes we do things that are going to take a long time to straighten out. So I'm not saying that we don't make really bad mistakes. But once you've made it, it seemed like a good idea at the time, or I wouldn't have done it. And if I could have done better, I would have done better. Okay, that's the truth. Do not hide from it. It will not help you. Reality always wins. But then don't think, oh, I'm a terrible person. I'm so awful about this. I try so hard and it never works. And I just, you know. And then we say, and because of my trauma and because of my this and so I'm here. So now you have not only the wrong action, but you've created an entire new vritti based on your response to the wrong action. None of which does anything to fix the problem. All it does is create an entire new, much more difficult to take apart story over here. And, and it's very egoic, even though we think if we're putting ourselves down, we're, we're overcoming the ego. No. Ego is just a false understanding of reality. And, and this is also a game that we play. Well, if I'm not the best, at least I'll be the worst. Because most of us, guys, we just float in the mediocre middle. You know? We're not really that good and we're not really that bad. We are perfectly adequate, but that's all that we are. <laughs> right? And, and we'd rather be spectacular on the dark side than just be what we actually are. I mean, honestly, you know, the internet makes you feel like everybody's living a glorious life. But most people are just like you and me. You know? So just say, yeah, boy, that was a screw-up. I'm going to have to pay for that one for a long time. And then we ask ourselves, wow, what did I do? Why did I think that? How can I really work on it? And then just don't be shocked. What you want to be is you want to be in what's true, not in what's made up on either side. That's the hardest thing. Yes. Okay. Does that mean, this, this is just a question of clarity right. on that very point. Right. So if we have people in our lives or a person in our life who is spending a lot of time begrudging what has happened to them or, you know, just turning their trauma over and over and over and over again, and you're one of those people who has to be near them while they're doing it. Yeah, like you're, you're married to them, you gave birth to them, right? Yeah. <laughs> or you or were the, born, or you you were born to, to them. Or you to be their yeah. friend, yeah. you know, and you're supposed to be there to support them. You know, do you kind of have to let them figure out that their yeah. energy is yeah, okay. misplaced? <laughs> No, but um, so are I'm, you allowed to point it out? Yeah. Um, no, here, no, but that's a very serious question. And then, and then we're going to take it to these two blonde ladies in the back because they've been so patient. But um, uh, the question is, okay, um, one of my friends was very helpful to me because I have this clever mind and everything that I think I can say. So I was going to help my friend, very good friend of mine. And after I helped her, she said, Asha, you explain my problems to me more clearly than I want to know them. <laughs> Which was wonderful advice, just wonderful advice. Okay, on another occasion, um, I, I'm a, in, in the context of Ananda, we have a, a ministry and I've been ordained in, in that, uh, it's a, an acharya, you would call it here. And uh, 
So there's, there was this man, and he was doing something. The details sort of escaped me, but I, I was going to help him. He's actually a very close friend, so I was going to help him. So I pointed out to him the shortcomings of what he was thinking and saying, which were you know, kind of like about as big as a billboard, so I just, it wasn't very hard to explain. But I explained it to him. <laughs> the next day, I see Swami Kriyananda, and he comes to me and he says, this other man called me last night, and he said that you said so and so and so and so. I said, of course, sir, that's not at all what I said. And you know, he's totally distorted what I said. And then, uh, let's see, and then I, I resigned from the ministry, at least I tried. <laughs> I said, sir, you know, because it was so like, if I could be so misunderstood, I said, I'm resigning. I'm not gonna play the Acharya role anymore. Resignation not accepted, Swami said. So that was that. And then he just, very seriously, he said, you must not only think about what's true, you must think about a person's ability to hear it. So then you ask the question, what am I doing? I can show you how clever I am because I can point out exactly what's wrong with you. So is this about how smart I am? Or do I really want to help? And if you really want to help, you have to figure out whether or not they can receive it. Simple as that. And otherwise, not only are you not helping, but when you make someone defend their limitations because you're attacking when they're still attached to them, they get even more entrenched. Swamiji, in one situation, there was a man in our community who was so difficult. He was just such a pill. And finally, Swamiji said, you know, I think we've had enough of the way he's behaving. I think we have to do something about it. So we all went, you know, this is going to, like this. I'm actually going to say what I believe is true. Ten years later, ten years later, all of a sudden, just even as it happened, it was in the middle of a choir rehearsal, God knows why, Swami just started taking this man on and, you know, just really trying to talk to him. Everybody was so uncomfortable. You might have even been there, Dunbar. The guitarist kept sort of trying, getting, trying to get music going, you know, like to stop it. But Swami just went. But I knew, because I knew, it was a straight line from Swami saying, I'm going to talk to him, to 10 years later when he finally did. Now that's true love. So you have to make your own choice. Yeah. I'm working through like post like traumatic accident with a lot of what feels like stored trauma that seems to be layering out and it's definitely taking me different places, but I'm, so I guess that's the question. If just what your perspective is on that. Okay. Is that enough of a No, it's a, it's a very good question. Okay, thank you. Okay. And I, I'll start by, you know, with a, an appropriate disclaimer. Um, trauma is not, my, it's not my life experience. Well, everybody's life has trauma, but in the dramatic sense that people mean it, mean it it's not been my life experience. And I'm not a neuroscientist. However, you know, there's a lot of metaphysics that would relate to this in a very natural way. Um, the physical body is a manifestation, is, it's an energy pattern. You know, this is Einstein's great revelation that the material world is just patterns of energy, and therefore it's completely mutable. And my doctor friend tells me every seven years all the cells completely recreate themselves, but weirdly they create themselves along the same pattern. So the question is, um, you know, what is causing that pattern to keep replicating itself? And this is where we get into metaphysics, which is about the chakras. And, you know, anyone who deals with yoga at all at least knows the idea that we have these uh, uh, vortices of energy within us from the base of the spine to the crown of the head. And it's interesting, you can cut the body off at the, at the juncture of the thigh, right here, whatever you call this, right just below the hips, you can cut the arms off. You can be a head and this torso, and you're still completely yourself. But if you, if you cross that line from either side, life force goes away. Because this is where in the body the, the energetic equivalent of life itself, which is the chakras. The chakras is an extremely interesting subject. I have many different classes on my YouTube channel, and I encourage you 
to go talk to them because otherwise I would answer no other questions. But the basic premise is each of the chakras represents a particular vibration of consciousness and every single action, feeling, experience that we have registers in the chakras and stays there as a pattern of energy, a pattern of fulfillment, a pattern of trauma, a pattern of unfulfilled longing, um, a pattern of desire, and all of it relates in one way or another to the, to the particular vibration the chakra represents. Um, every one of those vibrations is essential for human happiness, so it's not a question, we, it needs all of those chakras for us to live a balanced life. So it's not like we get to close them off one by one, but we have to direct the energy in the right way. And what happens when you have a trauma is this huge force comes in and we grab it. And then we create a lot of magnetism around that. And then that magnetism begins to draw other experiences to us based on, I'm afraid of this, it might happen again, I'm so upset. Mm -hmm. You know, all the different things that you can articulate with your mind creates, every time you have one of those thoughts, it increases the vortex, the Sanskrit word is vritti, which means whirlpool, whirlpool of energy, and then it keeps drawing more and more to itself. Thus, the event was a long time ago, but nonetheless, the, the root cause, which was fear of pain, betrayal by those who loved you, you know, continuous abuse, whatever it was, just keeps building. So now what you're dealing with, you think you're dealing with a thing, but there's no thing, there's just an energy pattern However, that energy pattern is what dictates the way the, 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 the mo literally the molecules that are attracted. So they also are built out of the same vibration. So then those people who are physical scientists and who can observe that, observe that there's actual physical changes, but they don't necessarily understand the metaphysics of why. So we can work on many levels to undo that pattern, yoga meaning not just yoga postures, but the whole science of yoga is the most effective way to deal with it because if you can change the energy pattern, if you can, if you can undo that nucleus, then you can release the whole thing because the important point to remember is there is nothing fixed about it. It is nothing but an energy pattern. But if you contribute a lot of energy to that, there is a lot of momentum in a certain direction. And you have to put out a comparable energy to shift that momentum. So you know, that's what you're working with. Now then we add to it the charming addition of past lives. Because the chakras are the, um, what the phrase we're using is the storage bin of your karma. So when the physical body dies, I think I was talking about this last night or somewhere in this room, the... Um, the pattern, the physical body dies, but the energy pattern remains because the energy pattern is really who we are. So if you have enormous unresolved trauma or disappointment, it doesn't even have to be enormous, you go to the astral world. When you come back, you just start over where you stopped. So you, you even actually, you know, attract another trauma because there's already a blueprint leading to that. Or, or when you have a trauma, you enter the geologic strata, that's what I call it, of trauma. I mean, I certainly have known sometimes when I've been very sad about something, when I felt grief about something, I find myself suddenly not clear about what I'm grieving. It's like I start with a catalyst, but then all of a sudden I am what I call, the, I'm in the geological strata of grief, which is to say whatever vrittis I have of unresolved grief, from who knows how many lifetimes, once I enter that room, the room is much bigger than what catalyzed me into the room right now. Now, the good news is, <laughs> all of this is just an energy pattern, which means it can be completely shifted by putting out a balancing contrary energy. And so think of it like this. If, if the river is flowing toward the sea, and then some debris falls into the river, the, a refrigerator, an old truck, a tree, falls into the here, and, and then somebody just sort of comes and dumps a load of garbage. And all of a sudden, the smooth flow of the river is broken, and a lot of that energy is distracted. And it spins around the refrigerator, and it spins around the truck. 
So we're trying to get from here to there. And then all of a sudden we find ourselves spinning around the refrigerator. We don't even know how we got there. But, but our energy flow is interrupted. So there's a number of ways to, to do this. We can examine the refrigerator. We can open the door of the refrigerator. We can see what's in the refrigerator. We can look at the brand. We can go on to Google and we can see what brand it is. We can examine the truck. We can get the registration, you know. We can spend a lot of time in the whirlpool looking at what caused it, which is not, not wasted work. Because if we don't know where our pain is coming from, we make really stupid decisions. Okay? So there is, to a certain extent, you really need to know, ah, refrigerator, truck, load of garbage. But once you kind of establish the self-honesty and the courage to know where it's coming from, there comes a point where you just don't need to know anything more about the refrigerator. The point is to break the whirlpool. And there's lots of techniques to do it. However, the reason there's a whirlpool is because the attraction of this whirling energy is stronger than the current heading to the sea. It's just an energy pattern. It's this is what you have to say to yourself over and over again. So the other way that you can deal with the whirlpool, which is a vritti, which is the Sanskrit word, the energy in your chakras, the other way you can deal with the whirlpool is to increase the power of the river flowing to the sea. And this is where people will say, don't worry, just meditate which is sometimes extremely annoying <laughs> because you're trying to meditate, but you keep going into the river. But it's true. Because if you can meditate strongly enough, and this is where the chakras come in, and really open the energy at the spiritual eye, then the river will flow so strongly, the whole whirlpool will be absorbed, and it will be like it was never there. Like, what? You know, where did, where did the refrigerator go? What happened to the truck? Did I ever even remember it was there? And usually that will happen over a longer period of time. It, and, and if your practice is consistent, if your practice is strong enough, it's energy to energy. So if you have the power, you can dissolve it without ever even knowing what's in there. Because it's a, it's a, a dynamic like that. And of course the best is to do it all, all of it. And not to panic when you fall into the vritti, because of course you will. One more point that's important is we have, uh, this is not encouraging, but it's a fact, we have so many buried vrittis, you have no idea how many we have. You know, how many lifetimes, we have so many. But yoga practice gradually dissolves them all because any time the flow of energy is stronger than your distracted energy in the whirlpool, then that whirlpool is added here. So not only are you less drained, but all the energy that was being drained out is now being delivered for your objective. The, the, um, the Dalai Lama said, well, he, um, he said, if you want to evaluate your spiritual progress, never think of a time frame less than 10 years. Because it's that kind of process. And you can almost everyone who thinks they're not making any progress can look back 10 years, unless you're only 10. But, you know and see, oh, I'm a totally different person. And this is why we also, without having any idea why, suddenly just react differently and feel differently. We just don't know why. But the other side of the dynamic of that is, no, you see, sometimes those whirlpools are resolved, dissolved harmoniously. And you don't even know it happens. And sometimes the refrigerator and the truck and the garbage load hit the river and the river goes completely gablooey. So both of them are positive. <laughs> and when the idea that God never sends you a challenge greater than you can handle is, a, is a, a devotional statement of the metaphysical truth, that that whirlpool will not surface and be drawn into the river until the flow of the river is strong enough to be able to deal with it. Now to be able to deal with it effortlessly is something else, or even, I don't mean to discourage you, to deal with it all in one incarnation, because some of these are really big and very old. So everything the neuroscientists say is true, and I would say 
you know, don't deny any help that's offered to you. Okay? Yeah? I actually left my body uh-huh. and then made the decision to come back. More or less to come back. Uh-huh. It just means that it means that you have there were more vitri more no, <laughs> it, it, it means that you had the good karma not to waste all the energy you put into growing up because okay. all you would gain from leaving your body is that you'd have to be a baby again. And then you have to be a child yeah. and my god you have to go to middle school again. <laughs> <laughs> and you just decided that was really inefficient. You know, I'm already here. I might as well just deal with it. <laughs> okay. All right. And here, this lady's right in front of you. We can do it right here. Okay. Hi. I spoke with you at lunch. Yes, you did. And we were talking about, um, well, I was talking to you about dairy and the horrific dairy yeah. industry. And how upsetting that is to me and you said I said ask me that question when we're in the workshop so is that that's what you my mean? question <laughs> yeah okay the, the you know we were having a oh or do you want the plant milk or do you want the da- dairy milk and you know are you are you dairy free you know all the things that you talk about when in the in the 70s especially when all of this was just starting um, and everybody was on a special diet for one reason or another I think it was through the, the TM movement at that time, Transcendental Meditation. They, they wrote something called, they wrote a cookbook that was passed around, and it was called uh, the Kabunza Diet. And, and they, they had this whole myth, you know, we, we went into the forest of the Andes, and we found these people, and they were, they were magnificent volleyball players, and they were able to spike the ball even when they were 110 years old. And... Their entire diet was this sort of dark, sort of soft substance. And you know, they just talked about this, and they were always peaceable and everything like that. So then they brought some of this. This is all, of course, just a joke. They brought some of this home, and they had it analyzed, and they found it was chemically identical to Hershey chocolate with almonds. <laughs> so the Kabunza diet was totally consisted of Hershey bars with almonds. And then they had all the recipes. Kabunza surprise. Hershey almonds on the bottom, Hershey almonds on the top, and a Hershey almond in the middle. (laughs) And then they talked about the healing crisis you would have where your teeth might fall out, but don't worry. So, (laughs) having said that, we were having a little conversation about dairy. There's lots of reasons, you know, why people are vegetarian or refrain from certain things. This ashram doesn't have eggs. It's not completely vegan, but there's no eggs. And there it goes. And a person has to figure out where you stand. What When I became a vegetarian and when I was uh, 20, which would have been a long time ago, um, my family insisted I turn uh, my diet over to a doctor because they thought I was going to die. So I wrote everything that I ate. He said I would outlive everybody. It was the healthiest diet he'd ever seen. <laughs> so we've made a lot of progress. And, and part of the progress that we're making as, we, as our consciousness elevates and we recognize ourselves as part of the world around us, we recognize that sentient beings exist in many bodies. And even though they, re- they present themselves differently, we are all one life force. And it becomes more and more difficult um, to act as if these are unconscious, inert beings. Our society being what it is, a great deal of that which we would never do ourselves is hidden from view. But things like the internet have completely changed the possibility of keeping secrets. And now these extremely vivid images, and so everybody's getting this opportunity to think about what am I doing, how am I contributing, and is there anything I can do? Now that's one side of it, and some people just feel moral repugnance at many things. Originally, you know, like people would love their cows and give them names, and so it, the whole opportunity to get milk, the milk was vibratorily different because it was a loving relationship between the humans and the milk, which is why in, I often look to India because it is the only continuous civilization on our planet where it's always been the same civilization. Nobody even knows when it started. 
You know, they have things 5,000 years ago and you have statues of people meditating and doing yoga postures. Nobody knows how old it is. You know, all the other civilizations have risen and fallen, but India's had its better and worse days. But, but the dairy products were always an integral part of their lives, the relationships to the cows and so on. So it's not inherent. It's a question of the fact that our society has become so oriented toward financial gain that all other values are, are lost in that confusion. So then as individuals, and which is the question you know, that we were talking about, a person has to decide which battles are my battles and which, um, which disappointing realities about this world are the, are, where is, are the hill that I want to stand on, where I want to live or die, you know, where is my battle? And sometimes because of our karma, you know, because of many different things, we feel powerfully drawn to one way or another, but merely because you feel powerfully drawn doesn't mean that it's a priority for everyone. You know, I, I personally, but not, not really because of moral issues, although I really appreciated being reminded, my physical body is happier if it doesn't have dairy products. So much as I like them, I, you know, my, my theory of health is that you have to suffer periodically. And so I just, I change. I, I suffer over this or I suffer over that. And I feel like I'm doing penance. And as a result, this body still works really well. And the most unfortunate one recently was the, the confirmation of what I knew to be true, which is that I was allergic to dairy. So I've had to give it up. But I didn't give it up for moral, moral reasons. I mean, I'm not allergic to it. I'm just happier without it because when I travel, it's impossible to always control. I, so I often choose to be gracious to my host rather than to be nice to the cows. You're in somebody's house, they serve you a beautiful ray of cheese. It's not the time to tell them about the brutality of the dairy industry. You know, because this world is imperfect. And that is just something we have to start with. We have this imaginary idea that this material world is going to be perfect. And if we can just adjust it a little here and adjust it a little there. And this is also um, a, a progressive a progressive aspect of spiritual growth is that the, the second stage of spiritual growth, which is, there's four, the second stage of spiritual growth is, I have creative creativity, I have energy, I have clarity, I'm going to express it, and the way I'm going to be safe and secure is I'm going to make the world conform to me. And so we work really hard to put the world in order. We want people to behave, we want situations to behave, and a great deal of, of, of altruistic or let's change the world energy, even though it's laudable and appropriate for people to do, is still, if I could just get it in order, then I would feel better. And what happens is it don't work. That's all. It just don't work. You try to explain. And you see also... At that stage, one is thinking primarily about what, what benefits me. We get more subtle because what benefits me is to alleviate the suffering of that animal. So it's, it's, it's more altruistic. But, but many people who are just coming into that stage do not think in terms of ideals. And, and it's premature for them to think in terms of ideals. They're just learning to use their energy creatively. I'm going to start a dairy business. And I'm going to figure out how to get more milk from these cows. And you say, well, what about the poor cows? And I say, who cares about the poor cows? And oftentimes, those who are beginning to awaken to an idealistic way of living try to persuade people that they should follow these ideals at the point when the person who's doing it has never even begun to consider ideals as the way to work. They're just rising to the point where they can use their energy for self-aggrandizement. And it's quite appropriate for them because that, that's the stage they have to grow through. Consciousness grows like a seed. And when this, I, you know, I, have, I have a small apple tree outside, I'll eat the apple, there'll be a little seed in there, tiny little seed. I look at the apple tree, I think, whoa, you know, look, this is you a long time ago. 
And if I planted that seed to make it an apple tree, it would have to go through every single stage between the seed and the apple tree. And no matter how I yelled at it or told it to be different, or how many people picketed around the apple seed as it grew, it, it couldn't skip a single stage. It needs that experience. So, here we are, and we are on a planet, and, you know, here we are. This is a very heterogeneous planet. In the astral world, you're only with your own vibration. On this planet, people at all different stages of growth. So one, one tries, and it's a necessary stage of growth, to try to get myself happy by controlling the world around me. And then basically at a certain point, somebody says, how's that working for you? <clears throat> and you say, not so good. So then you begin to ask the question, is there another way to live? And then you move into the third stage, which is, oh, the only thing I can actually control is my response. And my security has to come from the fact that I am in command of myself. And so then you begin to make other choices, not because you think it's appropriate the way they treat the cows, but your priorities are different and you can't do everything. You just can't do everything. And also you have to look after your own emotional um, health. And if you're just always focused on all of these things, a friend of mine has a, uh, one of her, her family has the freedom to take up causes and is a very, I'm going to save the world sort of person. My friend was telling me about the causes she, uh, that, that the relative backs and, you know, they're all, with all due respect, horrible, hopeless causes. You know, starving children, enslaved women, things like that. And I said, oh, so your relative gets to be angry all the time. <clears throat> My friend started laughing because that was exactly true. You know, she's now she's moved her anger to causes. And so we do that for a few lifetimes. And then we ask, how is that working for you? And we say, is there, is there, you know, is this really what life is about? To bang my head against these individuals who really are not capable of changing? Or maybe I need to work from another angle. So it's, it's tricky because it's still true. But we all can't do everything. We have to specialize. And we also have to ask, what brings me joy? I don't mean that selfishly. You know, because joy is not the same as, as happiness. Joy is what makes me feel that I am aligned with what I'm supposed to do. And so I don't use much dairy, but when it comes to me, I tend not to think about the cows. It's just because I can't take on every cause that there is. But if you feel that that's your cause, then you should do it with your whole heart as well as you can. But if you do it with anger, you see, then it's a shadow force you're fighting, but if you fight shadow with shadow, you're not going to accomplish anything. You have to bring light into it. So it gets very complicated. I am often criticized for not taking on more social causes, but I feel like I am because it's all about the human heart. Yeah. So just the, the yeah. part that I was trying to get to, and thank you so much for all of that. Oh dear, I hope that was <laughs> in some relationship to what you're asking. <laughs> well, my, my question on, you know, more energetic level is that um, when we partake of these things and there has been cruelty and suffering involved in the creation of it. I mean, is there any impact or residue? It's, it's, like, we don't listen to crazy, insane, radosic but this is, music because we're... This is, this is a question, this is a very individual question. Swami Kriyananda ate dairy products. He just did. He just felt that it wasn't, it wasn't sufficient for him to not do it. And he was certainly the most sensitive person that I knew. But God knows if you can, you know, spend the money to get the cruelty-free versions, then it's well worth spending the money. Are vibrations real? Absolutely. Vibrations are very, very real. And if you actually feel them, then by all means you should avoid it. I mean, just no question. If you feel it, you should avoid it because it's real. 
and now every time I, I look at a piece of cheese, you're going to make me really nervous. <laughs> because quite truthfully, you brought this much stronger to my attention than I have considered it. So now I'm going to have to consider it. <laughs> but you know, I, I get the ones with the happy cows, you know. I went to one time in my life, I really indulged myself at this very, uh, in, in Marin County, there's this restaurant called the French Laundry. And anyway, I was there and you, you spend, I was a huge amount of money for this incredible food is entertainment experience. And they serve you for three hours. I mean, I like food, but I'm not that, I don't like to fast, let's put it that way. I'm not that into it. But the waiters were all aspiring actors and they would tell you stories about everything they brought. And then when they brought us the butter, the butter was from a dairy in Oregon where a woman named Melissa has seven cows and your butter is from the cow named Buttercup, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it was absolutely wonderful. And uh, God willing, that'll be the world we'll live in eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for everything. Um, when you were talking about all of the conflicts that we're witnessing right now, which are truly so devastating and horrifying yeah. and kind of not, it felt like um, taking a side of, you know, anyone is all good or bad. And I'm just wondering how to hold um, the complexity of when it appears that there's just like so much trauma on both sides and holding compassion um, while engaging in in the world, you know, with skill and action. Like how does one watch what's happening and have your heart broken and also take right action um, while like holding compassion for all sides? Well, first hold compassion for all sides. Everybody's suffering. Everybody's doing, there's not one person in the world who doesn't have a justification for the actions they're taking. And just, it might be easier for you to look at them and see how deluded they are. If the masters look at us and we look just as deluded. It just depends on where you're standing. And there is a, a uh, this is an extremely difficult time, you know, you can imagine with my Jewish heritage talking about what's going on in the Mideast and everything, but it's like, it's all a shadow. It, let me say it. There's, there is no clear answer on that level. And that's what we have to, this is the same question as we were talking before about the dairy animals. It's really exactly the same question, which is you're not going to be able to find a clear point of truth here because everybody's being motivated on different levels and we're, we're not dealing with we're not dealing with a very high vibration where people can actually just reason it out that's the planet we're on I was talking about it yesterday we're at the beginning of an elevated age but we're not there yet and in the meantime these forces are just going to fight with each other so who's in charge is there a cosmic plan is there a divine mother who's watching this world are each of these individual souls following their own destiny and all of the suffering that is going to result in the confusion is necessary for them in order to come to enlightenment? The saints and the sages can see that. This is, this is the battle of Kurukshetra. This is Arjuna saying, you know, what's going on in the world now is not worse than what Arjuna was faced. He was raised with these people. He has to go out and kill his own grandfather who trained him. And so he naturally says to Krishna, and I mean, this, this story, is a re it's a real story, it really happened, even though there's a lot of myth around it, it's also a real story. Arjuna's entire life has been focused toward training for this final battle, he gets to the battle, Krishna's driving his chariot, Krishna puts him, Arjuna says, take me between the sides, and Arjuna says, guess what, Lord, I'm not going to do it. And he gives a really good reason, these are my cousins, these are my friends. This is my own grandfather. How can I possibly do this? Krishna says, you are using the words of the wise man to cover the actions of a coward. This is the battle that you were born to fight, and you must fight. Now, for us, what does it mean to fight? Okay, and this is where we have to understand that the real contribution, now again, this is personal. If you have a calling 
to, to stand on a protest or take a particular side or go to a refugee camp or join the army. If that's what you feel called to do, do it. But when you're looking at it, do not feel powerless. You are not even slightly powerless. The purpose of all of this chaos, and I did not say this yesterday, and it's, worth, it's important to say, Yogananda expressed that there will be extremely tumultuous times, world war, nuclear war, just get comfortable and get ready for it. It seemed like a good idea at a time for us to incarnate now. And so we're here, and it's doing that to you. It's scaring you to death, and it's confusing our minds. It's forcing us to go deeper and to think more subtly, because we can't just see the good guys and the bad guys and be with the good guys and the bad guys. It's all very mixed up, but that's exactly right. What is really true, and what? why am I here? Now, Yogananda said that the world has become completely lost from true values. Gee, that's not hard to see, is it? We don't need a prophet to tell us that. You know, it's all about money, it's all about greed, it's all about power, it's all about what you have I want and I can go in and get it. I mean, what is wrong with these people? You know, they're just so confused. But it's really, he said, for the purpose of bringing people back to an understanding of the divine power and our relationship to God and Guru, the angels, the masters. And so he, he went so far as to say it's people like us, and that's, yesterday I was asked what the us is, anyone who's thinking anywhere in the world in a more elevated way, we are the solution. We are already going in the direction that all of this is de designed to make people go. And he actually even said, those who love God will be protected. At what level of protection? You know, I don't know. Even Swami said, I don't know. But the purpose of the karma is to bring people to where we are already going. And so when we, and th this is, I feel this extremely powerfully, you know, we are solving the problem by living in the light, changing our consciousness, radiating out into the world. You have no idea how much power even one person who's, who's even str just trying to live by high ideals. This is an energy universe. And there's these vortexes of energy that are telling people to hate each other, and we are creating an alternate vortex over here. And... And that thought and that energy is going to shift this energy. Not before they tear each other to bits, but when that's all done, I mean, and I know it, our society will just rise from the ashes. And we're already organized. I have four apples, you're hungry, here, take two of mine. I mean, like it's a no-brainer, right? And you know, if this poor cow is suffering, let me take care of the cow. I can't just take, 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 take for myself. A friend of mine was ill seven years. She picked up parasites and it's completely debilitated her. She was very strong before, and by the grace of God, she's strong again. But for seven years, she wasn't. She just thought, maybe this is the rest of my life. I have to gather myself before I say this. But she, she just lay in her bed and said, well, God, I thought I was going to be able to do a lot of things for you. It doesn't look like I can do much, but I'll be one person on earth who loves you. You think that's small? So the challenge for you, the challenge for me in the face of all this, is, is to hold fast. It's not my show. Divine Mother knows what she's doing. I can say, I think this is a terrible plan. When Jesus was about to be crucified, he said, uh, Lord, let this cup pass from me. I mean, gee, he'd come to help all these people and they're about to nail him to the cross. Let this cup pass from me. He had an opinion. He thought it was a bad plan. But then he said, but thy will not mine be done. So we have to be authentic. I think this is a terrible situation, Lord. But you're in charge, so tell me what I can do. And then follow it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Boy, I don't even know what my original question was, but uh, <laughs> this has been so fascinating. Um, I think 
when we first, when I first put my hand up, I wanted to ask you about, I don't know, I was thinking, okay, if, if a person is going to be reincarnated and they can choose, you, you talked about choosing families, et cetera, is there a religion that you'd want to be chosen to be in? It certain, I, I wouldn't choose, I wouldn't think that it would be Catholicism, how I was raised, where you are dictated to. Um, I raised my kids Jewish, and there's a lot I love about Judaism in terms of the questioning and all of that. But I'm thinking, wouldn't I want to be raised? Wouldn't I want to come back to uh, to be born into a Hindu family of you know spirituality or something? And I don't know if you could talk a little bit about that. Maybe. Well, in the Gita, it says if you seek God in one lifetime and have to be reborn again, you, you're born two 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 beneficent things. One is wealth because then you don't have to wait to fulfill your desires. You get to fulfill them when you're young, and you don't waste a whole lifetime trying to be able to fulfill them. And it gives you privilege. Wealth gives you privilege. Opportunity is what I mean. And the other, even more so, is to be born into a family of people who love God. And the best way would be people who understand the yogic principles. When, when, when my friends were having babies in our community and then all these children are now grown up, and many of them are my my peer friends, even though our age is different. And I remember talking to this one young man who was about thirty at that point, and I I I as often I known him before he was born, like you know I knew his parents, and and I said, you know, I forgive me, but all of you kids, you were kind of like an experiment in a petri dish for us, <laughs> you know. It's like the Gita says. But very interestingly, only a very small percentage of the children raised in our yoga community have stayed with it. But all of them, without exception, have, have carry it. My favorite story, and then I'll answer your question more directly. My favorite story, a woman friend of mine has two children, and neither of them in any way accept our way of life. But they've maintained their friendships with the children they grew up with, and their friends are the ones who aren't part of our, our spiritual family, our community at this point. So she overhears her daughter talking with her friend, and her daughter says to her friend, who was also raised in our yoga community, and she says, you know, all our friends just get to do whatever they want, but the way you and I were raised, we always have to think of the deeper meaning of what we do. <laughs> so you know, it doesn't matter what it looks like. What really matters is what it is. And yes, of course, you would want to be born with as many, you would want to be born with as much momentum as you can for the life that you really want. But also, Swamiji said, sometimes a yogi will be born into a family where they don't have much karma, where they don't have much connection. His marvelous phrase was, a yogi will just get a body where they can. <laughs> And they don't want to be deeply invested in their birth family because they intend to leave it for their spiritual family. Which is, it's, so there's just, you can't game the system. <laughs> the best thing is to just be sincere and leave it in Divine Mother's hands and trust that your guardian angel will whisper in your ear. And sometimes you get contrary. You get exactly contrary to what you think. When I began to observe my family and some of the choices I made in relation to them, Many of their qualities in my family actually exacerbated my faults. And I would think, why didn't I get a family that would counter them? But because my, some of my faults were exacerbated, and part of it was also being Jewish, because with all due respect, you know, the Jews are the smartest people on the planet. <laughs> I'm looking at the ones I know in the room. <laughs> and all of these movements, all of these movements, 10% of the people within Ananda are, were, were raised Jewish. Because Jews are always in the forefront of the revolution. Every revolution ever, it's always the Jews. I have a teeny, tiny inclination to think I'm the smartest person in the room. Just a little, tiny inclination. So why was I born into a place that made it worse? You know, because it pushed me even farther in the wrong direction till I actually noticed. Because until you yourself realize that this is not something I want, you won't put out the energy to change it. Energy to change it. So uh, you know it was it wasn't all positive, even though I enjoyed it. One of my friends, 
who was raised very orthodox in, in Judaism in a very in, in enclosed environment on the East Coast. She, would have, she wouldn't have come to us if she could have been a rabbi, but the, at that time, she, female, she couldn't be a rabbi. So she was admitted, because she has a huge brain, she was admitted to some really high-level college on the East Coast, and she was sitting the first day in the room with all the other freshmen, and she looked around, and she realized that all of these people were smart enough to get into this college, and none of them except her were Jewish. <laughs> and for the first time, that myth just kind of shifted in her brain. Oh, oh yeah, we're not the only intelligent people on the planet, right? But you see, you can't always just say. It's not always obvious, because the vrittis are subtle. And it's not just what you're feeling, but it's how you're going to see the delusion of what you're feeling. So, yeah, you just, you, in the end, this is what makes you surrender in the end. You know, Lord, I have an opinion, and it's, it's fine to have an opinion. But after it, you say, what do I know? You know? I, I, with Swami Kriyananda, what I gradually figured out was it was like my view was like a television screen. We eventually made, a, I was part of making a movie, and I began to realize what the camera sees and what's actually going on is super different. But I, I, then I was on some television shows, and I realized what appears on the screen is super different than what's happening in the studio. So I began to realize that I could reason about people and situations from the point at which it entered the screen. And I could reason across like this, and I wasn't wrong. But Swamiji could see the whole studio. He saw where it came from. He saw where it was going. And so his perception of this tiny little thing was, was so often so different than mine. It wasn't because I was wrong. I was just too small. So this is partly an answer to the question, when do you speak? It you just depends on the karma. And how do you know the karma? You have to be calm in yourself. You have to have no... No agenda, you you know, countless things. True love. Okay? Joni had a question over here. Okay. You know, I really don't know. I didn't know the, the difference between Buddhism and Hinduism when I came here. That's um, fair. Um, I, we may not, still may not, but yeah, maybe go ahead. But, <laughs> but I mean, I, I knew Buddhism more. And okay. I had kind of a, you know, not a fairly, a, a fairly negative uh thought about Hinduism because of, uh, of the caste system. And mm -hmm. so, so one question is, you know, you refer to just leave it up to the Divine Mother. Mm -hmm. Like as someone who was brought up Catholic, I haven't been practicing for a long time, but I pray every night. And, um, you know, I just say, you know, kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm giving myself to you, just figure it out. You know, what um, is that where does where does like a really divine being come like the beatific vision like the 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 fact that i don't think that any as 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 wise and as you know as like totally tuned into the universe as these people could be we're just like one of billions of universes i mean the 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 mind or the it isn't a mind we have no i don't think we can conceive of God, really. I think we can love God, okay. but I don't think we can conceive of God. Okay, I think I can go somewhere with what you're saying. Yeah, honey, you're absolutely right. <laughs> you know, it's like we're just we're just playing around with these things um, compared to, you know, Swami Kriyananda would talk about being with Yogananda, who was a self-realized master, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And and he, you know, so was just admiring his master, and Swami said that. Um, let's see, he, Master asked him to help him lift him from a chair. So he was holding his guru's hands, looking into his eyes. And Master just smiled and said, if you knew my consciousness, meaning you're sitting there looking at me, but you have no idea. And Swamiji said, he said to us, because none of us knew Yogananda, he said, in many ways, it's easier for you because you feel him only as a vibration of consciousness. He said, I would sit in my room and he was having dinner next door. And I knew that this was, a, 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 he had an infinite consciousness, but he was a di dictating a letter. He was talking on the phone. He said the contradiction was often extremely difficult to integrate. So the lack of human form is sometimes helpful. What you say is exactly right. <clears throat> and we have to be very humble in the face of this. 
that we're just pointing in a certain direction. So at the same time, let me think how this goes. You know, in this, in this ashram, they talk about Advaita, they talk about Vedanta, where we're talking about a, a moving, removing all forms. Um, let me just try to get where I want to go with this. We're, that sometimes the way they describe it is if you have a thorn in your foot, you pick up one thorn to dig out the other thorn, but in the end you throw them both away. So a lot of the images and all of these wonderful deities and everything that's here, it, it has a reality and it's also just a window onto a transcendent reality. And you cannot intellectualize it into anything that actually um, is true because it just isn't true. So you have to ask, what is the nature of the human heart? And how can I build upon what I already know. And so we understand relationship. We understand love with each other. We, we understand masculine, we understand feminine. And so the, the masters help us by building on what we already know. When, and, the, and each avatar comes in to carry out a special message, bear in mind, an avatar is someone who, it, their consciousness is infinite, they have finished their karma, there's no buried vrittis, and people can be very close to that. And so they, they know a lot more than the rest of us. Okay, and what they have to work out is not going to interfere with their ability to help us. And so all of them have the same state of consciousness, but they incarnate at a particular time for a particular mission, and then the message they can deliver is defined by the culture that they've come into, the stage of enlightenment of the planet, um, and the needs of their disciples who incarnate with them also. So, for example, Jesus was a Jew. Everybody in the story was a Jew. The Bible is very um, misleading when it talks about the Jews did this and the Jews did that. The Jews were doing it to each other because worldly people don't care about these things. It's other spiritual people who see where the power is. But he was an avatar for the Jewish people because the Jews had gotten a little confused. And their concept of God had become a fierce and unforgiving judge with hundreds of rules that you had to follow, break any of them, and whack, that's the end of it for you. And it also had become a corrupt priesthood. I'm very careful when I teach this, and I don't talk about, I talk about the corrupt priesthood who were making money and had power off of what was going on. And Jesus was sent by God to correct that. But he, they were dealing with, a, with the concept of God as a judge. So he couldn't talk about God as in the feminine form. People completely misunderstand this. He could move them from a harsh judge to a loving father. And so he would say things like, if you ask your father for a loaf of bread, will he give you a stone? And you would say, well, no, my dad wouldn't give me a stone. You know, he'd give me a loaf of bread. So then the heart begins to have an image, which is just an image. It begins to have an image of what it is to be loved by a father. So then we can start understanding. It's not that we, we're trying to understand God. It's trying, we're trying to open our hearts. And so we need something we can open our hearts to. Now, Jesus, before the Catholics got to Mary, I mean, brought in Mary, which, was, which is true, um, Jesus snuck in the feminine, <laughs> but he snuck it in in this way. After I am gone, I will send you the comforter. That's what he said, I will send you the comforter. What is the comforter? I mean, think about the idea of the perfect, loving mother. What is the mother? The mother is the comforter, isn't it? When I was eight years old and I did this thing, I was lying about something which in my family was really, you don't lie about something. I was lying, but it all was a c catastrophic scene. And I, I'll never forget, you know, my mother knew I was lying. She just put her arms around me and held me and let me cry on her shoulder. I've never forgotten it. She was the comforter. Jesus said, I will send you the comforter. Like you can, words don't mean anything. It's the experience that you have. And then gradually over time, they brought in Mary. And Mary is truly what 
all the all the liturgy says she is. I mean, I realize she's the most active um, spiritual figure we have in the world. She's always appearing somewhere with some big message. I mean, many, many more times than you realize. She's just all over the place. I mean, I, I can't think of any spiritual figure who comes so regularly and so com because she's the comforter and we're suffering and she really wants to save us. Now, Yogananda came and now we're, we're quite into the father. We've gotten him down. Now we've begun a little, gotten a little mad at the father and all of you know, a lot of us women uh, were born to be men. You know, it's, I, I used to joke when we were much younger that we were the men we would have married. <laughs> but there's this movement, and, and we're responding to that movement. We're not creating it. We're responding to it. So Yogananda talked continuously about Divine Mother. Because now we can go the next step. And it doesn't denigrate the father. It doesn't denigrate the men. We don't have to fiercely change the pronouns. Male and female are cosmic realities. And the father is absolutely required. But then so is the mother. But we're now at the point where we can talk about the mother. And all of these wonderful deities are, are an effort on the part of great sages to communicate the uncommunicatable. One of my most interesting, I don't think we have Mother Kali here. Mother Kali is this fierce figure with black hair and a lolling tongue, and she has a garland of skulls, and she holds a saber in one hand, and she has her other hand out in blessing. She's quite a figure. I was in Calcutta during one of the festivals in, in the neighborhoods. The neighbors would get together, and they'd put up a big, more than life-size statue. Crowded street. I was with like 35 other people, and I was gradually getting pushed backwards just by the crowd like this, and finally I'm right up against something like this without, because I kept backing up, and then I turned around and my God, there she was, you know, bigger than me, just leering over me like this. And I, I said, who are you? It was just so shocking to me. But somehow in the moment, oh yeah, there it is, isn't it? You know, on one hand God has a saber and he's going to slash your head off, and on the other hand, he just reads out with his hand of blessing. Some great soul understood all of that and then gave us a symbol, which if we try to take literally, it's totally confusing. But if you take it intuitively, oh, isn't that brilliant? Isn't that just simply brilliant how it's done? So Buddhism, Hinduism, they all start at the same place. They all start with revelation, and then they gradually devolve into theology and opinion, <laughs> right? Very sincerely, but they just gradually just de devolve into that, and then you have everybody telling you what's true and what isn't, and then the cosmic force said, wow, time to send another messenger. This is not in Christianity because Jesus Christ appeared from nowhere. There's never been another one. There never will be another one. Just highly unfortunate theology. The Gita says, whenever virtue declines, and vice predominates, I, the infinite self, take visible form to destroy evil and restore righteousness. That's us. That's why we're here, guys, because we heard it. That's what all these, all these masters are doing. They're all part of that. They're restoring, and, and we're hearing it. Oh, yeah, this is what I want. And do religions help people? I was on a radio show decades ago, when Ananda was known because we were a community. This was the time when all the hippies on the West Coast were going back to the land, and we had goats and organic food. And So I was invited onto this show to talk about the goats, which I'd never even been close to a goat, but I was talking about the goats and the organic food. I mean, I see the goats. I've seen them. I know what a goat is. <laughs> So anyway, so I'm, we're waiting for the show to start, and I'm chatting with this guy. And I, I hear his story. He was a, a drug addict. He was just hopeless on the streets. And then, by the grace of God, he found our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless him. And now he was a staunch, devoted to Jesus, which I thought was absolutely terrific like this. So somehow in the course of things, he finds out that, that I'm about more than goats and organic food, right? And he unfortunately finds out that I follow the devil, which was a bit of a problem for him. So when the, when the program starts, 
he feels called to witness for the true teaching and perhaps to save me from eternal damnation. And so all of a sudden we're having a conversation about our Lord Jesus Christ versus the false prophets that I'm following, which puts me in a somewhat awkward spot because <laughs> absolutely the last thing I want to do is in any way diminish this man's faith. You know, I, I, I'm myself deeply devoted to Jesus, and I'm so glad that Jesus was able to reach this man. I do not want to touch it. So we kind of dance a little bit, and I finally say, you know, we kind of have a problem, because my understanding allows for both of us, and your understanding only allows for you. So I don't think we can really have this conversation, and I just stopped talking. So we're here, this was a puny little radio station, but you know, we're on the air and we have just silence. And I just sat there till he asked me about the goats because there was nothing else to do. <laughs> you know, every, every, Divine Mother knows what she's doing. You know, she feeds, she feeds her baby something different than she feeds her teenager because each of them receive from the loving mother exactly what they need to grow. And she gives some very difficult situations to learn through. And each of us has to have the inner strength and the calmness, the courage and the faith to know that everything is happening as it's meant to happen. And my responsibility is to do the best I can. 